Today's reading will be coming from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, Westside. It is so good to see you here today. My name is Cliff. I'm the associate minister here at the church, and I have the opportunity to be able to lead in our study. But before we do, I just need you to know I'm really struggling right now. After seeing that video clip of the kids' camp, I so desperately want to stick my finger in my ear and say this just in and segue, but I won't because my kids groan every time I do a dad joke. So I'm not. You're welcome. (laughs) Rough crowd, rough crowd. Hey, um, (laughs) um, let me just set up uh, last week. Pastor Matt did a great job in getting into our text, and he left it with this, that um, there was this metaphor that the Apostle Paul gives that's farming. It's like this communal farming where the Apostle Paul would come and would plant, then Apollos, a well-known and... uh, very good teacher would just teach the Bible and that watering that the Apollos would do would nurture people's uh, spiritual journey just through the teaching, but it's God who gives the growth. And we're going to switch metaphors today, the Apostle Paul does, to that of building. You know, uh, my dad actually was a professional tradesman, and I don't know if there are any tradesmen in the house, uh, anyone who's been involved in building, but this is what I know from my pops, that it's really difficult, like the skill level is high. He came out of Europe in the 50s, where he had to uh, go through a four-year track to become a licensed tradesperson. He learned about faux finishing, he learned about marble finishing, all the different painting, and the technique. He was even uh, an interior decorator. Like the guy was legit. And what I'm about to tell you is a little embarrassing for me. About 23 years ago, I uh, was planting a church and I needed to find a job that gave me some flexibility in uh, being able to make decent money, but being able to leave so I could work on the church. And I don't know what possessed me to do this other than serious stupidity. But I woke up one day and I decided I was a professional commercial painter. Now, I have no experience at that point of painting whatsoever. Um, I haven't been taught anything other than I've watched my dad paint a few times as a kid. And I think I helped him when I was eight staining a fence. And I somehow thought that that qualified me to be a professional painter. What's even crazier is I got a builder to hire me to paint a house for him. And so I go in as my, you know, skilled self that I was, I wasn't, and I started painting the job. You can only imagine how difficult it was for me. It was bumpy. I think I made about $1.73 an hour on that job. Aaron, my wife, was not happy. At the end of the job, we get to what's called the deficiency list. And you don't have to be in construction to know what a deficiency list is. And what uh, we worked out was that the homeowner would just get some post-it notes, would walk through the home, and whatever they thought was a deficiency, they would just put a post-it note on it, and that that would attract my attention to know what needed help. So I didn't really know what to expect. It's my first job ever, uh, and, you know, my skill level was so high. Um, I, I went in there and opened up the door, and I didn't know what to expect, but what I saw shocked me. It was like a preschool teacher got her whole class into the home, armed them all with post-it notes and said, kids, this is an art project. Put all the post-it notes on the walls. And that's what happened everywhere, all three floors. I was horrified. And I started looking at all the deficiencies. I'd take the the post-it note off and I'd look and I was like, 
I think, I don't think that's a legitimate issue. Like I felt that the homeowner was being punitive and they were, they were just straight up bothering me with all of this stuff. Like here's a tip I, I taught myself about day two of being a professional painter is that, you know, that there's focal points where your eye naturally goes. And so I do a really good job there, but some of the inconspicuous areas like a crawl space, I'd give maybe a C plus effort. Those places had like two post-it notes. And, and so I navigated through all of the post-it notes and um, I walked away with two immediate takeaways. My first takeaway was this, my work matters. Now, I don't know what I was thinking. I was thinking I was just gonna come in and just mail it in and you know get some paint on the wall and it'd be a win. But the fact is that somebody was paying a significant amount of money for a home, for their family. The stakes were high. And then you had all of these professional trades coming in. Every trade that you would need to build a home would come in day after day after day for months doing their professional trade. And I was part of that. And I, it was lost on me that my work mattered. I just, that was a weird takeaway for me. And the second takeaway for me was that my work would be evaluated. Now, I was evaluating my own work, and I told you that, you know, focal points, I do a really good effort, but then some of the inconspicuous places, a C-plus effort. But what surprised me was that the, the homeowner was going to come and evaluate my work. And what really I struggled with is they were the one with the authority. They were the one that commissioned me to paint, so they were the one to be able to evaluate how good my work was, and when it wasn't good, that they would be able to call me on it and say, you need to do a better job. And then the third lesson, which I learned as I grew a little bit, was this, that I was really immature. I was really shallow. I was self-centered. I didn't know it at the time. But looking back, I'm like, I, if I had any self-awareness, it would have been easier for me. I, I could have done a better job, but I didn't. And so for those of you that know about Construction, you're going to love today because it's, it's, a, it's real meat and potatoes. It's A, B, and C, and you're going to love it. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you that we can just come here from our busy weeks and to just stop and to listen to what the Spirit might be saying through the text. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be quieted by every distracting voice, that we would only hear what the Holy Spirit would be saying in this moment, in this text. So Lord, would you speak to us? Would you be gracious to us as we navigate some of our struggles of distractions and hardships? We'd have quiet hearts to just hear and to be together with you. Praise in Jesus' good name, amen. So our text picks up in verse 10, and the Apostle Paul writes this, according to the grace of God given to me. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think, what does that mean, according to the grace of God given to me? We need to figure this out because this is apparently the thing that, catal that is a catalyst for Paul to do what he's doing. About 25 times Paul writes in his writings according to the grace given to me. Now, I need to be clear, you, you probably know this, that when I say the Apostle Paul wrote this, what I'm actually saying is God the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul and Paul wrote this. It's like God wrote this through Paul's pen. And the fact that it was written about 25 times in all of the Pauline epistles tells me by the sheer repetition that this is an important thing. The grace of God given to me. So I started reading all these different verses to try to figure out what does that mean, the grace of God. I read in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And 2 Corinthians 6, 1 not to receive the grace of God in vain. And if you were to just read through all of these different phrases, you would begin to understand that grace in this context is something tangible. 
Like it's, it's quantifiable. It's, it's a real thing. It's, a, it's like a noun. It's a, it's a thing. What is this thing? It's God giving us gifts that manifest in so many different ways. It might be manifesting in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It might be manifesting in ability. It might be manifesting in characteristics or in gifting. It seems to be really broad. Have you ever watched somebody do something that you find particularly difficult? And you're like, yikes, how do they do that? I could never do that. Th that might be them operating in their gifting. It's a gifting that you don't have, but they do. Just like the opposite is true. People are watching you do some of the things and they're like, that just looks really difficult. I don't know how they do that. But you don't even notice it because it's so intuitive to you. It just feels so natural that you don't think it's a big thing. But I just need us to recognize that God gives us grace. And it's different. So here, according to the grace of God given to me, so this is Paul's catalyst. Because of how God has gifted him, what does he do? It says in our text uh, that the grace was given to build foundations. And in our text it says, uh, like a skilled master builder. And in the Greek, the, that phrase, like a skilled master builder, denotes an architect and a designer. And if you were to read through the New Testament, that you would see that Paul started a lot of different churches. Theologians will suggest about 14 or so churches Paul has started. And what he does is he goes into these cities like Corinth and he will just start to preach. There won't be anyone there, but he'll, he'll start to just preach. He's planting the seed. And he'll just begin to do his thing and then the Lord will begin to do a work. And once there's critical mass, what he does time after time is he will install some le leadership at a local level, some pastors and elders and deacons. And he, he will say, there you go, do your thing. He just kind of backs away and goes to the next city and repeats the process. And so you might go that what Paul is doing here is to build foundations that you could go that he's building these churches, the foundation of these 14 plus churches, that he lets other people do. And that would be true. But I actually think we can take it a little bit further than that. That when you read all of the Pauline epistles, what you see is that Paul teaches the churches about church leadership, about church government about generosity, about mission, about correction and rebuke. He, he teaches these churches through all of these letters. And what I think is happening here is that not only did Paul lay the foundation for these 14 plus churches, every church that had started after the apostle Paul up until Jesus comes, it's on the foundation that Paul laid. That's what I think this text is meaning. It's, it's the 14 plus that he started, but all of this West side is one of them. In verse 11, he's, uh, the Apostle Paul says that no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I already told you, I'm not really good at construction. Um, but this I know, that the quality of the foundation and the quality of the building are completely linked. You cannot separate the two. A couple of years ago, I was in a refugee camp just off of the coast of Turkey on this small Greek island, and uh, the, the conditions were really poor. And the refugees had, we called them structures. To say they were a tent would be too generous. And it was just like a couple of poles and, and like a tarp. And multiple families would live in these structures, and there was zero foundation. It was rough ground. And I would watch these families try to navigate as they would cook or change diapers with their babies. And it was so difficult because the ground was just so terrible. There was no foundation. And when it rained, obviously, you know what's going to happen. The rain would just come seep in and would damage everything that these refugees had. The few things that the refugees had would get damaged by the rain. They would improvise by going through the refugee camp and through this island uh, called Lesphos and, and look for pallets because they would just put down pallets and just get off the ground a little bit. But it's still, it's a little bit better of a foundation, but it's still not great. The minute that the wind come, came off of the, off the coast, the structures fell over. Why? 
Because the foundation matters. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus himself talks about foundations. This is Jesus. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Here what Jesus does is almost paints this prophetic picture for every single one of us and what Jesus is saying to every single one of us, that if you were to, uh, who hears these words of mine and does them, will have a firm foundation, which is Jesus. And we need to stop here for a moment. It's not just hearing and acknowledging. It's not just knowing cognitively what Jesus says. It's the, t- the combined of knowing and doing. And what Jesus is saying is that when the storms of life come, when calamity comes, oh, and it will, if you have heard the words of Jesus and you do them, you will be able to withstand the calamity. It's still going to come. It's going to be difficult. I'm, I'm not minimizing anything here. But then juxtaposed to that is the idea of the person who builds their house on the, uh, on the sand. No foundation, Jesus says, is like someone who does not listen to what I'm doing. And what is happening is that when calamity comes, uh, the house, it fell. And great was its fall. And for some of us, maybe we're having a light bulb moment right now when we sit there and we go, I wondered why I was able to withstand the, that storm so well. I wonder why so-and-so was able to just keep their marriage together or keep it together, you know, through that difficulty. And please, just so we're clear, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me. It's all about Jesus. It's what Jesus is doing. It's, it's, It's through our faithfulness, but it's what Jesus has done is empowered and allowed us to withstand the calamities. And there might be some of you that you have watched the storms of life hit people that you know, maybe it's even your own life, and how they respond, it's almost unrecognizable. Like, they're like, I didn't know, what's happening? And we just watch in horror, and again, that might be a picture of the person not having a relationship with Jesus that they think they do. And the difficulty and hardship is showing a true litmus test of what their relationship with Jesus is like. Why? Because the foundation matters. And I love what, how Paul says this. The foundation that matters is Jesus Christ, right? We know this. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those that believe. So this, the gospel, but it's the power of God. It's not a message. It's not a story. It's not a narrative. It is the power of God manifesting in words. Friends, do you believe that? Do you believe that as you speak this gospel message, that there is something supernatural that happens in your words, that God gets a hold of him, God, the Holy Spirit will will do something profound and miraculous as you speak this gospel message? Because according to Romans chapter one, that it is the power of God, the word power, dunamis, it's explosive. It's like lighting a stick of dynamite and just watching and seeing what's going to happen. But do you believe that? Like, let's just stop for a moment and absorb this gospel message that the holy, all-powerful God of the universe created this earth and created Adam and Eve. And the quality of life that Adam and Eve had with God was perfect. Like, I mean perfect. Their marriage was awesome. Their communication, second to none. 
Their relationship with God was meaningful. Their quality of life was high. Like, I mean, it was perfect. It was flawless, but, but sin entered the world. And when Adam and Eve fell into sin, it's not that two people sinned, but it's like they are our first parents. And when they sinned, sin entered into humanity like a DNA. You know, this just kind of hit me this week. It was a little shocking as I thought about this. Uh, my opa, at about 42 years old, died of a massive heart attack. And my dad, about the same age, had a massive heart attack. And I'm realizing I have a, a DNA, a, a genetic disposition to heart issues. That's a little concerning for me. What's even worse is that at about in my early 40s, I had an incident where I have massive damage consistent with a huge heart attack. I didn't do anything to deserve that genetic disposition. I'm a nice guy. <laughs> the fact that you're laughing at that, <laughs> this is a rough crowd. But I didn't deserve it. I ate healthy, well, for the first 35 years of my life. I worked out, I had the body of a Greek god, I was amazing, but yet I, I, I my, my, oh boy, oh boy. This is my first time and you're making me feel so welcome. I love it. My point is, is I did nothing to deserve this genetic disposition. Just like for you, you could be a really nice person, you could be honest, but you still have a sinful DNA. And there's nothing that you can do in and amongst yourselves to escape this genetic disposition of sin that separates you from God. Humanity, human history has taught us, we've tried. We've tried to be nice, we've tried to be generous, we've tried to be benevolent, we've done all kinds of things in trying to fix this broken part of us that has separated us from God and there's nothing we can do. There's, there's this air of hopelessness to it. But God, in his love, sent his son. Now let's just stop and think about that for a moment that Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven into human history in the form of a baby, willingly. And as God steps into human history, takes on the form of a baby, it shows us over 33 years that he was perfect. By that, he lived a sinless life. And he willingly, willingly went to the cross to die in our place for our sins. And on the third day rose from the dead, conquering sin, hell, and death. And the Bible tells us that if anybody believes that Jesus' death on the cross paid their sin debt to God the Father, there is this shift internally. You can't see it outwardly just yet, but internally it's a shift. And the shift is this, that a person who is sinful now is is forgiven. Why? Because Jesus' death paid their penalty of sin. What they could never do. It was paid. They're that from cursed to that of blessed. Then not only that, they become to move forward into becoming more into Jesus' image and likeness. And Galatians 5 talks about things like the fruit of the Spirit where we become, because of Jesus, it's a byproduct, love, joy, peace, patience. Like This is really good news. It's the hope for humanity. Folks, friends, do you believe the power that comes in that message? I've, I've gone, uh, what's so crazy, that builder who gave me a job painting the house, he hired me again. Uh, go figure. And there's one time I'm working at a, at a pub re, re, redoing um, the wood on the tables, and I had all these young men just uh, around at the end of their shift, and they're having a pint, and we're talking about Jesus, and we're talking about all kinds of things. And like, I just need you to know, like, it could be in a pub, it can be anywhere the power of God shows up when we speak this gospel message. It's supernatural. 
It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And I love what the Apostle Paul does here because he sits here and the foundation that he's talking about, that he's laying, is about Jesus. Paul now shifts his attention from the master builder, from foundations, and he shifts his attention in our text to the building. But not just the building, specifically the quality of contribution of the people that are doing the building. Let me just maybe sum it up this way, um, just so we're all clear. I want to understand this metaphor. Number one, the building that we're talking about, it's the church. That is going to be defined in two ways. The capital C church is the church global, but also the small C church. Then every city, every neighborhood, there are these small local expressions of the capital C church. West side is a local expression of the overall body of Christ. Number two, the church is defined by Christ followers. What is West side? It is not the building. It's the people who come here that are Christ followers, they're believers. That is the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 summarizes these two points nicely. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, just for clarification, let's go on in understanding this metaphor. Christ followers are part of this building, the church, but we're also called to work on the building of the church. So not only are you in it, you're supposed to work on it. You coming to church here today for our 11 o'clock gathering, I'm so glad you're here, but that's not building the gathering, just so you know, it's not building the church. Showing up is not building the church. It's more than that. It is so, so much more than that. And Paul now wants to talk about how well a Christian individual is at being a builder of the church. And in verse 13, and this kind of terrifies me, he says, it will be revealed by fire. It the quality of our work on the capital C church will be revealed by fire. That there is going to be a day where God the Heavenly Father will evaluate our contributions, the sum total of our lives in building the church. And he puts them in two categories in descending orders. It'll be gold, silver, and precious stones, or it'll be wood, hay, and straw. That is to say that for some, the work will actually, through fire, is going to stand the test and it's going to last and there will be an eternal impact. But there's some, the contribution, the quality was so low, it burned up right away. It didn't, it didn't last, it didn't make it. So just so we're clear, what's not being talked about here is an individual's authentic conversion. Verse 15 says this, that if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. So we're not talking about whether you're a believer or not. All that this text is talking about is, as a believer, how well is the work that you're doing in building the house? Because every Christ follower is called to build the church. The capital C church and the small C church. We already looked at it in 1 Peter 2, 5. talks about the priesthood of all believers. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20 is the Great Commission. And when you look at the Great Commission, there's this inclusivity. It's for all the Christ followers are called to go and make disciples. One theologian described uh, the church in Corinth like this. They said that the patterns of the city worked its way, leaked its way into the church and became the sins of the church. 
that just the goings on of the city just leaked its way in and it became a problem for the church. And I wanna just maybe take that for a moment and look at it because uh, I think we struggle with things in our culture day and age that is similar. This almost will sound weird, but stay with me. I think uh, outsourcing is one of them. See, we outsource all the time as a culture. Like right now, if you were to look in my garage, my Jeep is there. I, I should have driven it here today, but I didn't because there's something broken in it. I popped off the tire. I had a look. I can't figure it out. So what am I going to do? It's what you do. Call somebody who can fix it. I've got to call a mechanic, someone who's qualified, someone who's trained. So I don't have to deal with it and they can. Throw a little bit of money at it and we'll be good to go. We do that on all kinds of things. And again, that's awesome. That is wisdom right there. But when that trend leaks into the church, we have to be careful. Because what if we are outsourcing our calling, sidestepping our giftings and going, our work doesn't matter. My contribution doesn't matter. And friends, it does. I'll give you an example. Someone who know, who doesn't know Jesus and you're having these conversations with them and they're all of a sudden asking you questions about Jesus and about faith and whatnot. And there comes a point where you're like, yikes, I got to stop. I don't know. I'm, I'm not confident in my gospel message anymore. I need to outsource that to a community group leader, a pastor, somebody that's not me. And we're outsourcing our calling and we're sidestepping our giftings because every single one of us are called to be proficient in the gospel message so that we could easily speak it when the opportunity arises. But then it comes back to, friends, do you actually believe that that gospel message is supernatural? Do you believe that? Because if so, it might help you in your confidence because it's not about you and your ability to deliver. It's super awesome. It's just that, that there, there's, there's supernatural power in those words. God makes those words supernatural. It's fascinating. And we don't get to outsource that. Matthew 28 is very clear. 2 Peter is very clear that we are supposed to embrace this. Friends, I need you to embrace that. I need you to sit there and go, right, I get that. I recognize that. When, when somebody's going through a hard time and, and, and the calamity is coming and, and the storms of life are coming and, and they call you up, it's late at night and they're stressing out, their texts have tons of emojis and you're like, what is going on? And what do you, you want to go, ooh, I'm uncomfortable with that one. Let me get you in touch with somebody who is more skilled and qualified. You know, in that moment, all that's necessary. The Bible just says to weep with those who weep. There's no silver bullet in that moment that'll take away their pain. There's nothing to outsource in that moment. It's just you to be there, to weep with them, to stay with them, to pray with them. And I, I'm afraid that as a church, where we, like a capital C church, a global church, that we sit and we outsource the things that we are called to do and we're sidestepping our giftings. We're not paying attention to our calling. The fact is, the gospel is so, so amazing. The fact that every single one of us don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve anything other than God's wrath. Ephesians 1, we're by nature objects of wrath. But the beauty is, but God sent his son. It's, it's about Jesus. That's what I love. That it's, it's, it doesn't, we, we always think we're somehow deserve, deserving of grace, but these other people, they're really bad. They don't. No, we're all the same. And that we all need God's grace. Folks, I just want us to get a hold of that. Because if we get a hold of that, if we make this gospel, Jesus, the foundation, our front and center, it will always keep us on mission. We will never get distracted by the cares of life. It's always about Jesus. Not only will it keep us on point on why we're here on this earth, but the other thing it does is it always will impact our, our posture, that of humility, that of worship, that of open-handedness. That is why this idea of having Jesus as the foundation is crucial. So let me ask you some questions. 
What's the grace of God given to you? Do you know? It's actually something we need to figure out because according to this text, it is the thing that will launch us. It's, it's the catalyst into meaningful work, meaningful building on this building. It'll mean that we're strategic. It'll mean that we're effective. And if you know what, your, uh, what the grace of God given to you is, awesome. And you know it and you're off to the races. But there might be some people here that you're like, I don't know. I actually have no idea. I was kind of just signing up to serve somewhere because I thought that was good enough. And that is great. I'm so thankful that you're serving. But what if you went to community group this week and you just led, you just hijacked the whole community group and said, folks, I just, I don't know the grace of God given to me. Can we talk about that? And, and I, full disclosure, full disclosure, a couple of weeks ago, I'm out for lunch with friends of ours and we started talking about giftings and I tried to, I had an agenda. I was like, so what do you, do you remember what I've done here? Like, do you think that's my calling? Like, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of leading and baiting the conversation through suggestions. Don't do that. Just open handed to brothers and sisters in Christ who you know and you trust and who you love and say, what do you think? See what they see. Maybe you don't notice it. Maybe you've got blind spots. Another thing you want to do maybe is look for the patterns. Don't look for the incidents. Look for the patterns of where God is showing up time and time again and just seems to be coming through. And you're like, I have no idea why that happened. It might be because you are operating in the grace given to you. Look for the patterns. That might be a clue if you don't know. My next question is this. Are you building the church according to the grace given to you? See, here's what I know. I've been in this church leadership for 30 years. And I've had people come up to me and say, I'm bored. Like I'm bored. Like, and it's your fault. <laughs> oh, what do you think I should do? I don't know. Probably some more dynamic programs. That'll just fix my boredom. Others will go, I just, I'm uninspired. I'm like, you are, you're pretty flat. <laughs> Say that in love, of course. What if, what if it's not the church's fault for entertaining you and, and, and trying to coddle you to the point of activity? What if, what if maybe it's right now, God, the Holy Spirit is shining a flashlight on your boredom and saying, son, daughter, it's not that the church is boring. It's that you're not operating in the grace given to you. And what if the call is for you to pivot? Oh, the stuff that could happen. Like right now, uh, Aaron, my wife and I, uh, for the last 15 months, we've been on this pivot. See, I'm, I'm 51 right now. I know I don't look it. And I see the finish line more than I see the, the starting line. And I'm really only thinking about eternity. That, that's it, that's all I think about. I want whatever I do, I want it to last beyond my life. I, I want it to last for eternity. We've been reorienting our life. Why? It's our joy. God has is, is, is put this passion in us. We've moved homes. We've left friends. We've left family. And we've taken this risk and this step and we do this with a joyful heart. But I'll tell you what, life is not boring for us. As we take these steps of faith and as we just see God coming through time and time again, we're like, whoa, that was God. That's amazing. Friends, if you're bored, if you're uninspired, not only are you going to be prone to sin, but you are not strategically operating the grace God has given you. And I want you to build the church 
And even as I'm speaking right now, I, I have to trust, I have to believe that God the Holy Spirit is nudging some of you. There is no right answer. It's only, I just want you to be faithful. For some of you, give money because you've been withholding your money. For some of you, give of your time because you've been holding of your time. I don't know what the right thing is. Only you and the Lord can work that through. But I just want you to build in a way that is faithful to God. And watch what happens. It's going to be beautiful. So are you building the church according to the grace that God has given you? And then build on the right foundation. Just build on it, which is why it's Jesus. Moms and dads, as you navigate how to raise your families in the sin-cursed earth, and there's so many voices, and you, and you don't know what to do, Puritans call a family a little church. And lead your little church with Christ as the foundation. Calamity will come, but I believe Jesus will be faithful, and you'll be able to withstand yeah, you might have a limp, but you'll be able to withstand. Why? Because it's about Jesus. We're not talking about philosophy. We're not talking about art. We're not, it's, it's just about Jesus. So build it on the right foundation. In the, your, the people that you know, encourage them, spur them on for godliness. See what God does. And lastly, your work matters. Your work matters in the building of the house. It matters. And I know what you do. It's what I've done. We, we have all of these excuses. In, in our 20s, our excuses are this. I just got to get through school. I, I just got to figure it out. I just got to get my degree. I, I just got to figure it out. And, and you give yourself permission to make that the main thing. And when you're in your 30s, you got someone to agree to walk down the aisle with you by some miracle of God, and you get married and you have babies. And you're like, I'm just trying to get my kid to be able to have matching socks. And that is like, I'm peeking at that. And so you give yourself permission to sidestep your giftings and, and your calling, and you just focus on this. Yes, we're called to have godly families. I'm not saying that, but there might be more. And then when we're in our 40s and 50s, we go, ah, it's a young person's game now. I'm going to let the young people do it. I'm just going to sit back here and just cheer them on from the sidelines. I only know because I've heard people say that to me as a church leader for 10 years. And you've got these young people fumbling through and you've got people with so much gas in the tank just sidestepping their calling. They're just letting someone else do the work. It's, they're not recognizing their work matters. And then when we're in our 60s and 70s, we just think age has made us irrelevant and we just fade. You know, what's interesting about the Apostle John's life is this, that at a very young age, the Apostle John was already doing some significant work on the church. Uh, a lot of theologians think that when he was running with Jesus for the three and a half years, he was just a teenager. He's just a very young man. So much so that he was young enough to be in the crucifixion with Jesus. Uh, usually they didn't let men come that close. But just because he was that young. And then as Paul got older, or excuse me, as the Apostle John got older, uh, in, one, in 1, 2, 3 John, uh, he's an older man and he's just serving in the church in Ephesus. Like, like There was no time where he removed himself and he outsourced it to someone else. He stayed in the grace that God has given him, operating in the gifts that God has given him. And then when he's a very old man in his 90s, he's still enough of a rebel that he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation. See, whatever reason we give ourselves to have an excuse to stop building the capital C church. It's a false reason. It doesn't matter our stage of life. It doesn't matter. Why? Because we're called to build. Our work matters. Can you bow your heads? Can you close your eyes? This is the time where, as a church body, we, we consider what the Lord might be saying. We call this a response time. 
In a few moments, we're going to have communion. And how we do communion here is we have stations all over the church auditorium. And there is the bread, which is, represents the body of Jesus given to you. And then there's wine or there's grape juice, which represents the blood of Jesus shed for you. Dip that bread in whatever your conscience allows. I want you to go back to your seat. And I want you to just stop and consider what's God the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? Is there a response? And for some, it might be confession. For some, it might be a realignment of priorities. As you sit there and you realize you've not been faithful what God has given you. And if that's your feeling, I just want you to know, I see that as such good news because it's the Holy Spirit is moving you and calling you to pivot right now. It's the pivot that Aaron and I made a year and a half ago in a bigger way, in a greater way. You don't have to stay in this state of feeling unfulfilled and lack of passion. God's being gracious to you right now. Once you've finished your contemplating, once you've finished any confession, once you've finished your business with the Lord, I want you to take the communion when you're ready. And then respond in worship. Raise your hands. Sing joyfully. Sing loudly because our God is great. King Jesus, I thank you that you came to this earth and that you lived a sinless life and that you were our model, our primary example. And I just pray that in this holy moment right now, that those of us that are being convicted, we would just respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit and just yield, just yield to you. Thank you that we have the opportunities to remember what you did on the cross, Jesus. I pray that it'll forever keep our orientation towards you as our focal point. So be with us now. Be gracious to us as we interact with you. Be gracious to us as, as we worship. And Lord, thank you that as we do worship, that we know that you are inhabiting our praises. You're here, right here, right now. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen.